Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's now time for another monthly update. It's my October 2019 favourite. Uh, this month there isn't going to be any London stuff to report particularly. I have been getting out and about more but it was mainly socialising so there's nothing much I can tell you about there. And as you'll know the reason I haven't been going out very much is because I've had an infection in my foot um, which turned out to be uh, eczema we think. Um, I've now finally seen a dermatologist so I've got some emollient cream like moisturiser to apply all the time because I've got very dry skin. Um, it seems to be helping I think. I've only been using it for about a week as I record this but it seems to be having an effect already and I've got some topical steroid cream to use for the actual main problem area. Um, which I'm not sure is working, we might need to try something else, but that's not a problem. The fact that the emollients keep my skin nice and soft and there's no irritation there, and the antihistamine pills I'm taking are helping as well, it's meant I've been able to go out and about a lot more. So during October I was doing a lot of socialising with various people. Um, so that was great, to be able to get out and about more and see my friends and stuff like that. Um, there was one major event I was going to do in October, but it had to be postponed until January, so I won't be able to say anything about that until then. But I'm really looking forward to it, because that's going to be awesome. So... Like I say, there isn't any London stuff to mention, which I apologise for, but there are various other bits and pieces I just want to touch on. The big news, the big good news I've got this month is that my personal independence payments application was successful on the first attempt. Didn't have to go to appeal, which is brilliant. Um, I'm happy with the award they've given me. Yes, there are some points that I didn't get awarded that I could have been, and I do have legitimate grounds to appeal them. But I'm going to stick with the award that they did give me because the points they did award me seemed fair and the overall outcome works very well for my needs. I am going to do a blog post and probably a video all about my PIP experience because obviously it's a very hot topic. Um, it is a deeply flawed um, process as everybody knows. So yeah, I'm glad that's out of the way. That is a huge weight off my shoulders. I don't think you realise necessarily how much kind of stress or you know fatigue that kind of thing is causing until it's kind of done and dusted it does feel like a big weight off and of course if anyone watching this is going through the personal independence payments claim process then you have my sympathies and i wish you the very best of luck with it in terms of visual impairment the rnib's toolkit is very very good and for claims in general for all disabilities i highly recommend the guide on the benefits and work website which i'll link in the description and in my blog post um, i'm not endorsed or sponsored by them in any way to say that it was recommended to me and i found it really really useful it's really comprehensive going through everything with you obviously if you can get some personal support as well from someone to help you go through the questions and fill it out and all that kind of stuff that's brilliant as well that's very important but yeah if you want some stuff to read through yourself as well that's one option you can have and you can also get help from places like assistant advice and various charities maybe there's charities relating to your condition or whatever who can help you so yeah do look around there is support out there the other disability related thing just to quickly mention is to say thank you to Victor for including me on the list of recommended blogs in their Parents Hub website which is a new website they've set up as a one stop resource for parents so they can get all the help they need in you know, how to look after a visually impaired child which is a great initiative so you know, I'm happy to give that a bit of a plug as well and I'm very flattered to have been included as one of the people on their bloggers list so thank you very much to them for that. So then moving on to technology now and one thing I want to mention is an audio game called Pitch Black A Dusklight Story. I've not really been into gaming for quite a while I used to play PlayStation games quite a lot but then when I got into work and was staring at a computer all day every day coming home and focusing heavily on a TV screen to play games because you have to focus really quite strongly to and do things in games sometimes. It wasn't doing my eyes any favours basically so I just kind of drifted away from it and gave up on it. But I've been caring about audio games lately, obviously you've got the Amazon Echo machines and things like that which have little games and quizzes built in which I keep meaning to have a go at and I might you know film myself doing one or two of them if you want to see me do that. But also there are more elaborate kind of games being developed out there and Pitch Black is one such example. They've just had a very successful Kickstarter campaign which is fantastic. I played a very early build demo of it where you could explore one particular area and you had to find a couple of particular locations in it. And basically you don't see anything on the screen, you do everything through 3D binaural audio, so you wear headphones for it. And it sounds like this world is all around you and it's very atmospheric. There's lots of characters in the environment, lots of sound effects and things. And yeah, I've never played an audio game before, but I find it very easy to get into. You know, once I've figured out how to move my character around and you can place markers as well to find specific things. And the game has its own tool in there where you can focus, you know, in the direction that you're kind of facing to hear specific things that you're aiming for. Um, it, it makes sense when you play it. The YouTube channel Illegally Cited has a playthrough of the demo, so I'll link that in the description. I really enjoyed that. It just it did feel like it's one part of a larger environment the way they've done it, and there's a very dramatic storyline in there as well. 
and all the voice acting is really good. I mean, even as I was just walking around this little kind of mini part of the, the, the world, you know, I was passing all sorts of characters along the way and just stopping to listen to them, you know, in like this marketplace area. And there's a radio station at the end as well. I've just kind of got sucked into listening to all this stuff because it's, it's really good. They do have a YouTube channel with various vlogs and character trailers and all sorts on there. And they're all over social media as well. And there are other YouTubers as well who have done interviews with them about the game. So, you know, I'll put a couple of links in the description and a link to my blog as well. So you can find out all the information you need to about it. It's, it's a very intriguing project. So I have backed them on Kickstarter. I think it's a great thing to support. Good luck to the developers with that over the coming year and I look forward to seeing what it's like when it comes out. And then the other big technology news from October is the fact that we now have disability emojis thanks to Apple adding them to their latest iOS update. I'm only using an iPhone 6 so I can't get that update but then I don't use emojis very much anyway and in my particular case I don't use a cane very often, I don't use a guide dog. It's the smiling face with sunglasses that suits me more and that already existed so I'm happy, but yeah, among the disability community, obviously the fact that you can now choose things like a person with a cane or a guide dog or a person in a wheelchair or a deaf person or something like that is really great. You know, it's great to be represented in that way. It's really cool that they've added it to the list along with, you know, various gender options and there's race options and all this kind of thing. So it's becoming more and more diverse, the whole emoji set, which is brilliant. The able-bodied community are obviously a bit confused by this. Um, some of them have queried why blind people need emojis that they can't see. Others have even made jokes to the effect of, you know, oh, blind people will be happy when they see these emojis, which is a pretty lazy and unoriginal joke, really. But they simply don't realise or are not prepared to try and understand the fact that, firstly, 94% of people registered blind have some level of useful vision. It may be a very minimal degree, but it is still useful whatever amount you have. Cause it's a whole spectrum. You know, sight loss isn't just on or off. It's a whole infinite spectrum of different possibilities. So, yeah, some blind people can see those emojis with their eyes. They may have to zoom in on the screen using the accessibility features on their phone, which the people making these questions and jokes have on their devices they have those accessibility features built in so they can see them for themselves or try them for themselves so yeah blind people can zoom in on these icons if they want to and if they really can't see them it's too much of a struggle or they can't see at all then the device you know their computer or their mobile phone whatever will speak it to them because every emoji has a description included so you can actually hear what it is which when someone uses a ton of emojis in one of their posts means that the screen reader reads every single one out one after the other which makes a post take ages to get through. Um, so it is a bit frustrating for blind people when you know they have to listen to all these emojis especially if they're repetitive as well. I think some people also think that you know emojis should just be about emotions but they're not you know you've got flags in there you've got hobbies and sports and technology and food and drink and all this kind of stuff it's much more of a language in and of itself really you know you can use emojis to summarize points you know rather than using words you can just use an emoji to say what you mean and that helps you save characters obviously if you're on twitter you've got a limited character set or in text messages or whatever it's a great way of being concise and it can make messages look a bit more fun and interesting than just plain old text so yeah emojis have really evolved a lot over the years i think that's why the word emoji seems to come up more than emoticon which seems to be the word that came up originally and that kind of suggests emotional icons whereas now emoji kind of takes the word emotion away a little bit it's still there at the start but it's not quite so um in your face as it were so yeah that the emojis have definitely evolved a lot over the years and as for people making the jokes about blind people not being able to see them it's a pretty lame joke and if it was just being said the once then that would be fine you could shrug it off but it's that kind of joke being made all the time by lots of different people so it irritates and even distresses some blind people. So it would be nice if people stopped doing that. You know, the same goes for people posting pictures of blind people using phones and mocking them for that. There's a bit of a trend of that going on in some quarters. And I think the more people see it happening, the more they think it's acceptable to do it. So it'd just be nice if people had a bit more kind of respect and common sense. I'm very happy the emojis are there. They're not something I'll be using a lot of myself. Um, maybe in the future, as and when my site changes, I will. But at the moment, I don't have a need to. But I'm very happy people have got them and they're happy with them. Emily over at Fashion Eyster has made a whole video talking about this. So go and watch her video if you want to see her thoughts on it. And also uh, Ella on her blog has also written a post about it, including a comment from myself as well as many others on social media about their thoughts on the matter. So I'll put a link to that in the description as well. So then moving on to entertainment and the various bits and pieces I've been buying and watching over the month. Um, the big box set I got during the month was Freddie Mercury Never Boring, which is his solo collection. You've got a remastered version of the Mr. Bad Guy album in there, the orchestrated version of the Barcelona album from 2012 that they did, 
and a CD of some of his greatest solo hits, along with a DVD and a Blu-ray of his videos, and a nice big book full of photos and quotes from him. It's a lovely set. It's not as good as the big solo collection set that came out in 2000, which was really deeply comprehensive with loads of B-sides and demos and rarities and all sorts in it, and a great book with lots of text and photos again, and there was a DVD documentary as well as his videos. So that was the best possible set there's ever been. Um, but it's still nice to have this new set with remastered tracks and the book as well. So yeah, I've done a review of that set and the solo collection set as well in a separate video. So go and watch that if you want to see unboxings of both of those. In terms of Blu-rays, I bought the Blu-ray for Toy Story 4, which I saw in the cinema earlier in the year. And it's been great to watch that on Blu-ray again, especially as I can sit closer to a TV screen than I can in the cinema. So I was able to see even more detail this time. And it's got audio description on there as well, which is fantastic. I bought the 3D edition because it's got an extras disc in there that isn't in the regular edition. I can't watch the 3D version of the film because I haven't got a player that can do it, but also my eyes wouldn't be able to cope with it properly. So thankfully there is the 2D version of the film in there as well, because I wouldn't have bought it if there wasn't. So yeah, I was able to watch it properly on a standard Blu-ray. And it looks brilliant, obviously, in high definition. It's fantastic. There's so much detail in there. And the extras are good fun as well. You know, there's some deleted scenes that they never filmed. You get to see like storyboards of those. And there's character profiles and other behind the scenes bits and pieces. So it's a good set of extras on there as usual. And it's just a great fun film. You know, it didn't have to be made. They could have left it at Toy Story 3. But I'm glad they made this, this new one regardless. And then I also got the new Blu-ray edition of An American Werewolf in London. Which is a brilliant horror film. It's very funny as well. Which is like a comedy horror. And... Yeah, basically it's got all the original extras from the previous edition, but now the film has been given a full 4K restoration, so it looks as good as it possibly can in this day and age. Um, there's a new audio commentary on there in addition to the one that already exists, and there's also more special features as well. So it's really, really comprehensive now, this set. There's so much in there. There was a more deluxe edition, in fact, that included a book and a poster and some postcards as well, but I didn't really have a need for them, so I decided to just go for the standard Blu-ray special edition, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm very happy I got that. You know, it's a great film, so, yeah, I'm happy to get that in its newest format. And then the other Blu-ray I got was the Steelbook edition of Doctor Who The Specials, which are the final episodes of David Tennant's reign as the Doctor. And they're brilliant episodes, and you know I already had them on Blu-ray, obviously, but this set is an upgrade, partly because of the Steelbook with the artwork, because I love the artwork they've been doing on all these different series Steelbooks. I've got Series 1 to 4 in that format as well now. But also, you know, you've got all the extra features that have been ported over from the previous edition as well. Plus, for the first time, there's a new bonus disc in this edition, which makes it all the more worthwhile getting because you've got the two animated episodes, Dreamland and The Infinite Quest, plus you've got The Wedding of Sarah Jane Smith from The Sarah Jane Adventures. That's a two-part story that featured David Tennant guest-starring as The Doctor, so it's great to have that included. And there's a brand new interview filmed this year with David Tennant on there as well. So yeah, it's a great set of extras. I enjoyed watching all of those. You know, I still prefer the live-action episodes to the animated ones, but you know, the animated ones are still interesting to view. And I enjoyed the Sarah Jane Adventures episode and the interview with David Tennant was very interesting. So I'm glad they added that disc in. That was a nice little bonus. And then in terms of dramas, the one big binge watch for me this month was Stranger Things on Netflix. I watched series one to three of that in quick succession because they're very addictive. I know I'm a bit behind the curve on these things, but then I kind of like that because I can see if shows are living up to the hype or not based on people's reactions rather than just watching something because the marketing people say I should. That doesn't mean it's any good or not. And yet it's really good. You know, there's comedy and action and drama and you know, obviously science fiction, special effects in there and horrors, all this kind of stuff. It's a good mixture of genres. It's really entertaining. I can't say too much without spoiling things obviously but basically it's about a boy who disappears from this town and his family and friends and the local sheriff are obviously trying to find him and he ends up somewhere very unusual such as the nature of sci-fi and there's also this mysterious character called Eleven that turns up she's got a backstory of her own too and it's also got a brilliant soundtrack as well the composers Carl Dixon and Michael Stein have done a brilliant job with the score it's really atmospheric and it's resulted in no fewer than five soundtrack albums for the three series I know that sounds crazy but there are five albums just of their scores and it's just a delight to listen to it's great for background music it's nice to have on when I'm working or something like that it's that kind of thing but also the show is set in the 80s so you get classic hits of the decade there as well so there are two compilation albums of tracks from the decade as well which is cool 
You won't hear uh, should I stay or should I go in the same way again uh, if you watch that show, that's for sure. So yeah, I highly recommend it if you like the idea of something like that. It's really well worth a watch. I can totally understand why it's so popular now because it's brilliant. And then over on Sky, The Flash is back for season six as well and that's proving to be as entertaining as ever. The one thing I will say though that I quite liked was the fact that they used uh, the Flash theme by Queen in the show, which is about time too, you know. I'm glad it finally got an airing in the show. They found somewhere to stick it in. So that was fantastic as a Queen fan, as I am. And then, of course, I've been watching a lot of comedy as well, as per usual. Uh, I'm not going to mention every single show I've watched, but there are a few just key things I want to pick out and tell you about. Um, firstly, Would I Lie to You was back for a new series, which I wouldn't normally mention because it's always consistently hilarious, it goes without saying. But what was notable about the first episode of this series was that it had blind comedian Chris McCausland in it, which was fantastic. You know, it's great to see a disabled comedian being represented like that. Um, he did a great job. He was very, very funny. And he seems to be on a bit of a run at the moment. He's very popular. Um, he's also going to be on this season of Have I Got News For You, which is brilliant as a guest. And he's also going to be on the Christmas edition of Live at the Apollo in December. So that is fantastic. I'm glad he's doing so well because he's very, very good. And then the other thing to mention about Would I Lie To You is the fact that normally at the end of the series you get an episode of Unseen Material. So it's a compilation of deleted scenes, basically, where you get to see more of the stories that just didn't make the final cut because half an hour flies by very quickly. They should do 45-minute editions, really, like QI and Have I Got News For You because that would work really well for that show. The difference this series is that we're going to get two episodes of Unseen material at the end of it so it just shows you how much they're cutting out so yeah that's fantastic we're going to get two of those episodes that's brilliant taskmaster has just finished its ninth series and was consistently brilliant again as per usual the one thing that's going to be interesting going forward is whether it's still going to be on dave or not because the deal between the production company avalon and uk tv who run dave and gold and other channels has run out so they're now kind of opening the bidding to everyone else because it doesn't look like uk tv will be able to afford it so Channel 4, I believe, are interested. The BBC are interested. Others may be interested. So the rumours are Channel 4 might get it, but we just don't know. It would be nice if it stays on Dave because they deserve it. It's their show. But if another broadcaster gets it, that's fine if it keeps the show running. I just hope they don't change it too much because the format works fine as it is. And then sticking with Dave, they've also had another new series this month by Dave Gorman called Terms and Conditions Apply, which is basically Modern Life is Goodish. But instead, this time he's got a group of comedians with him, three guest comedians, who we can discuss things with and play games with and stuff like that. So it's a slightly different dynamic to the show, but it's basically Modern Life is Goodish in effect, because Dave is still looking at the same kind of things that he was before, you know, things on the TV and the internet that catch his eye. You know, he's always looking at the bottom half of the internet to see what comments people are making and just picking holes in, like, news articles and things and odd things in TV shows and odd products he finds, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's very good. It's very entertaining. Channel 4 have been doing a new series called Harry Hill's Club Night. So you get Harry Hill's own surreal brand of humour, and then he's also introducing other guest comedians as well. Some are better than others. But again, it's been great to see disabled comedians featured on that show. But yeah, it's just great to see Harry back on Channel 4, you know, doing the kind of stuff that he does best. You know, he's great at that surreal kind of humour. And then we also had a Halloween special of Not Going Out as well, which was good fun. It basically saw Lee trying to sneak into this old woman's house to get his mobile phone back that he'd left in there. And his dad turned up as well, making things worse, of course. It was quite an unusual episode in the sense that there wasn't a studio audience and there was some atmospheric music and stuff like that but it was still very good you know it didn't um, deter from the enjoyment of it so yeah it was nice to have something a bit different from them the one other thing that i just want to point out is the good news that red dwarf is coming back for a feature length special and as well as that feature length special there's also going to be three retrospective documentaries looking back over the whole series so that's going to be very interesting as well and yeah other than that i'm just kind of watching the usual things you know like the last leg of the new series is still open all hours and stuff like that so yeah there's plenty to watch and now in november i'm watching lots of other things as well there's various dvds coming out that I want to get. I've already got the new Monty Python box set and there's various other things coming out and various new things on the TV I want to watch and I'll tell you all about that in the next video. And indeed that is it for this video really. There isn't anything else of particular importance to mention I don't think. As I say November's been very busy already. I've been out and about doing some exciting things in London that I'm very interested in telling you about. And yeah it's just nice to be getting back into that kind of thing again really because you know after my life update in August that some of you will have seen it's been nice that things have been resolving themselves and settling down again. I'm just getting back to normality again now. It's going to be nice to just get to Christmas and relax and just celebrate the fact that I got through this year. And then, yeah, just start fresh in the new year and just see what adventures await then. But there's plenty to enjoy the rest of this year before I get that far. So, yeah, that's it. That's all I can think of for the moment. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe as per usual. 
and I will see you next month for my next favourites video. Bye for now.